All right, so we need to continue on with some simple machines. And really, these next couple are sort of variations on the incline plane. First one is a wedge. And a wedge, you could think of as um, a double-sided incline plane, sort of two incline planes sandwiched together. That's the shape that you make. Imagine this is two incline planes stacked side to side. And a wedge does a couple things. First off, it transforms a downward force into an outward force. So if you imagine, as you apply a downward force here on this wedge, it transfers that force into an outward force and pushes material apart. A thinner, longer blade provides a greater mechanical advantage. So really, a wedge is basically any sort of blade. You know, some examples, scissors. If you imagine the shape of scissors or any object that's sharp, it's sharp when it has a very thin, narrow blade, um, like a knife, the tip of a nail. Does anyone ever use a log splitter like this? It's just like a triangular piece of metal. You put it on a log like that, and then you hit it very hard with a sledgehammer and it splits the log apart. It's like a manual log splitter, not one of, the, one of the gas powered ones, but basically you hit that wedge and it splits this, uh, this log apart. And it does that because it's transferring the downward force into an outward force. So that's a wedge. A screw is also an incline plane. A screw is really an incline plane that's wrapped around a cylinder. So you have in any screw this sort of ridge of metal that goes around a cylinder. And often a screw is used for fastening objects together. And if you could imagine, if you have a, a nail and a screw, they have the same length, you need to put them into wood. Think about the forces you apply. To get the nail into the wood, what do you have to do? Just hit it with a hammer. Hit it with a hammer. You've got to hit it pretty hard. How about to attach the screw? Think about the force. Do you have to use as much force? No, you just have to sort of twist it. But again, what's the trade-off? Takes longer. Takes longer because every time you turn that screw, it's only actually going into the wood a small amount. Okay? So you can use less force, but you need to do that over a much greater distance. And so, you know, screws are used in lots of different ways. The jar of a lid is actually a screw that has those threads on the inside. A drill bit, obviously a screw. Um, this type of screw, this is a jack to lift the car up off the ground. And it has these very, very fine threads. Has anyone ever had their parents change a tire, like a flat tire on the side of the road? Anyone ever use one of these kind of jacks? OK. Do you have one? So what you know is that you attach, um, you attach something, a handle here. But to lift the car off the ground even just an inch, you have to turn that jack hundreds of times. So you're doing it for a very long distance, but you could lift the whole car off the ground just using one hand. So it's multiplying your force, but you have to do it for a very far distance. Um, if you were to unravel the threads of a screw, it would look like an inclined plane. Like you can imagine unwrapping the threads here, the screw, it would form an inclined plane. 
And the steeper the threads, the less the mechanical damage. And if you go to the hardware store, if you go to Home Depot or something, and you look at the screws, they come in different thread threads. Some are very coarse, where the threads are steep and spread out. Then there are some that are very, very fine. And you choose those based on what you're going to be using that screw for. Now, to measure mechanical advantage, um, we're not really going to measure the actual mechanical advantage of a screw. You could. You could measure the, t the force that you have to apply when you turn it. Okay? Um, but we're not really going to do that. What we're going to be measuring, if we do, is the ideal mechanical plane. That's something that's easier to measure. And the way we do that is you need to know two things. Again, effort distance and resistance distance. Okay? So if we're looking at this example, let's say the length of each of these screws is two centimeters. That means when I screw it fully into the wood, it's going to be in two centimeters. But, if you look at this two screws, this has coarse threads, this has fine threads. These threads are steeper, these are not as steep. Okay? So we can actually measure the length of threads. Sometimes if you have a string and you wrap it around each thread, and then you stretch it out, you can measure actually the length of those threads. Okay? So if we did that, we would find, let's say these threads, the total distance is 16 centimeters, whereas these, are eight centimeters. So obviously, what's the ideal mechanical advantage of this screw? See it? What's up? Eight. 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 No units on mechanical advantage. And the ideal mechanical advantage of screw B? Eight. Four. Four. So. If you think about what this means, you'd have to use less force, half as much force, to turn this screw to get it into the wood. But what's the trade-off? Yeah, you're going to have to twist that screw twice as many times to get it into the wood. Okay. So you can use less force to get screw A in, but it's going to take twice as many turns. Okay, and our last one for today, <coughs> a wheel and axle. A wheel and axle is another type of simple machine. And it's basically a wheel that turns a rod that we call an axle. And a wheel and axle is often used to multiply the force that we're applying. This is another one where we'll really just kind of measure ideal mechanical advantage. We're not going to measure the actual. Did anybody ever have, um, I live in an old house built in the 1930s. I never have in your house like the doorknob fall off the door. What's coming out? So once, if the doorknob falls off, what is there sticking out? What is it? Like a screw thing, like a narrow little rod. So if you get like locked in the bathroom or something, the doorknob comes off, this part will still be sticking out. But if you try to turn that, it's really hard to turn. Okay. Because you don't have the wheel part of the wheel and axle. And so um, the bigger the knob part is, the bigger the wheel, the more it multiplies your force. Okay? And it makes it easier to turn. So in this case, the radius of this knob is 12 centimeters, and the radius of, I mean, the radius of the wheel is 12 centimeters. The radius of the rod is two centimeters. That would give you a mechanical advantage of what? Luke, Jake, six. six. Oh yeah. So what that means is multiplying your force six times. You know, this is a, a wheel and axle, too. Even though this doesn't look like a wheel, this is still a wheel and axle. The bigger this lever, the easier it is to uh, 
to move that. Um, there's other examples like a ratchet. You use a ratchet. Um, that uh, the socket set okay, that multiplies your force. Okay, it's really a wheel and axle. Or you have use a pipe wrench. Okay, the bigger the pipe wrench, the more it multiplies your force. Some other examples. Um, so I've never seen one of these boat lifts that look like this, to lift like a boat or a jet ski out of the water. Has anyone ever used one of these? Anybody have? So with this, what you have is this, this is the wheel and axle here, and it's attached to a cable, and it lifts your boat out of the water, your jet ski. But when you use this, so you could use this one hand and lift your whole boat out of the water. But if you use this, later, how many times do you have to turn it? A lot. You have to turn that thing for a very, very long time, okay, to lift that boat out of the water. And again, it's multiplying your force, so you can use very little force. But you have to do it for a great distance. Okay. The gears on your bike work based on wheel and axle system. Okay, that um, if you have a big gear on the front of your pedals and a smaller gear back on the wheel means that one turn of your pedals is going to move the wheel how much? A big turn here and a small wheel on the pedals, what's that going to do? What? Yeah. So you know if you're riding your bike and you put on the biggest gear in the front, how is it to pedal? Harder. If you put on the tiny gear on the front and the big gear on the back, you turn your wheels one time, but how much does your wheel on the back turn? Just a little, but it's much easier. That's when you're spinning your wheels, you have to pedal really fast to actually go anywhere, but it's allowing you to use less force. If you're going up the hill and you put it in that very low gear, you're using less force, but again, the trade-off, you have to pedal a billion times to get yourself up that hill. Versus when you switch it around, and you put it on the highest gear, one pedal of your pedals moves the tire a lot. It's hard, you have to use a lot of force, but you don't have to pedal a lot of time. Again, it's that trade-off. Difficulties. <laughs>